Thank you all so much for attending this important webinar that comes at a critical time for Yemen. Um, you know, special thanks to Demand Progress and Quincy Institute for the support putting on this panel with FCNL. Uh, you know, huge thanks to our guests, Aisha Juman, Bruce Rydell, uh, Marcus Stanley, and Anel Shaleen uh, for joining us. And behind the scenes, I wanted to thank Kat, uh, Desk Camp Renner, and Kay Vaughn at Demand Progress for supporting this. Um, our event is called Yemen at the Crossroads. Uh, updates on the humanitarian crisis and what Congress can do about it. And at this event, panelists are going to offer updates on the war and the blockade, the ongoing humanitarian crisis, the U.S.'s ongoing role. Uh, we're going to highlight stories from the ground in Yemen. I'm really excited that Aisha Juman is with us here today from Sana on Zoom. Um, we're going to try to offer some perspectives on what role Congress can play uh, in ending U.S. involvement in the war and blockade, including an analysis of provisions in the FY 2022 National Defense Authorization Act. And um, as I mentioned before, consideration of this year's NDAA uh, comes really at a critical time for Yemen as roughly 16.2 million people are at risk of famine right now. The UN has warned in March that 400,000 children are suffering from severe acute malnutrition and could perish without urgent action. Uh, the House of Representatives recently passed, the, passed several NDAA amendments uh, by Rep. Khanna and Chairman Meeks, which respectively seek to end and limit U.S. Uh, participation in the Saudi-led war. Uh, the text of the Senate NDAA, which I've heard is going to be moving uh, as soon as next week, also contains provisions on Yemen. Uh, there are key differences in approach that our panelists aim to try to help folks understand. And for context, recently a 56 national organization coalition sent a letter urging Congress to end all support for the Saudi-led war and blockade. Um, despite growing pressure from lawmakers, civil society, and Yemeni American activists uh, against the Saudi blockade, uh, during the month of September, unfortunately, the Saudi led coalition only allowed 9.5% of Yemen's monthly fuel needs through uh, Red Sea ports. And we're going to get into all that and more. I want to just introduce the first panelist. If the other panelists could turn off their cameras for right now, I'm going to introduce Aisha Juman. Uh, from Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation. Uh, Dr. Juman is the president of Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation and also the founder. She has 30 years of experience in public health, including viral vaccine preventable, preventable diseases, child health and nutrition, primary care and women in development. Dr. Juman is currently working as an independent consultant coordinating health related projects in Yemen. Um, Aisha, thank you so much for being with us here today during your busy trip in Yemen. We'd really just love to hear about your travels if you'd be willing to share them with us, uh, as well as any insights you can, you can provide about the current humanitarian situation and impacts of the ongoing war and blockade that you think Congress should know about. Thank you very much, Hassan, and thank you to the other panelists and to the listeners today. Uh, it's, I'm in Sana'a now, and for me to get to Sana'a, it was actually a very challenging trip. I left Seattle, where, that where my home is, on September 6 at 9 a.m., and did not reach Sana'a until September 10 at 8.30 p.m. I had spent one night in Cairo, and I also had spent another night in Aden. And then I had to have a private car to drive me to Sana'a because the road is actually extremely difficult and unsafe. Um, so the private car is actually quite expensive. It took me 14 3, 30 minutes, 14 hours and 30 minutes from, from, Sana, from Aden to reach Sana'a on a very dif difficult roads, including a waterway, driving on rocks. And if, if it rains, then you just have to wait until the floods goes through the waterways. We drove about 10 kilometers uh, per hour for about three hours, then going up a steep mountain. And if there is an accident, the road is blocked. 
We also passed a lot of checkpoints. I would say probably around 100 checkpoints belonging to too many armed groups, and they can at any point in time detain any traveler, and you don't know what you know who their bosses are at, at most of the time. On the same day I arrived to Aden, a young Yemeni American man, Abdel Malik Asenabani from the north, was killed at a, as a, a checkpoint in in the south in Lahat. Presumably because he had some cash on him. To date, his body is still held and his family has not been told who killed him, although it was very clear from the videos released that it was a checkpoint soldiers that killed him. Another Yemeni working for MSF was killed a week later at the same checkpoint because he also had some cash and was going to Aden to buy a car. Some relatives of mine, a week before I arrived um, to Yemen, were killed in a car crash on the same road that I had to take. Everybody in the family died. They had just come to Yemen after several years being out of Yemen. My nephew, his wife, and his two children, seven and three years old, on their way back to Hadan to take a flight out of Yemen, had a car accident because the night before there was rain and the road was slippery and they had a crash. This is, this, these are personal stories. These are people I know and care about. And you can multiply that by hundreds of thousands to see how much people are suffering just to get in and out of Yemen. In addition to that, we all have to stop in other airports selected by the Saudi-led coalition where Yemeni are mistreated and delayed sometimes purposefully. My nephew who had to fly through Sudan airport, Khartoum, was delayed from around noon until about 6 a.m. the next day before he was allowed to take his flight. His first flight left without him because the people at Khartoum airport decided to, to do so. Of course, Sana'a Airport has been closed for a long time. In August 2021, NRC and CARE put a statement saying that thousands of critically ill patients are stranded with Sana'a Airport closure. It's been five years since the Saudi closed Sana'a Airport. And this has led to thousands of sick Yemeni civilians um, prevented from seeking urgent medical care outside of Yemen. The airport closure is also causing economic losses estimated to be in the billions over the last five years. This is again from NRC and from CARE, worsening for further an already dire humanitarian situation. The director of um, NRC in Yemen, Isaac Oko said, it's like a hostage situation that has lasted for five years. If we look at the Hodeida port, we realize that Hodeida is the largest port in Yemen. It has the capacity to uh, receive about 70% of Yemen needs. Items coming through Aden port that is under the Saudi and the UAE coalition control are not, and then are coming to the north are double taxed. They're taxed by the internationally recognized government and also taxed by the government in Sana'a making things extremely very expensive. And also the roads, as I said, are very difficult to travel. Fuel is scarce, as Hassan said, uh, and expensive, making everyday items in Yemen unaffordable. I just talked to the, to the director of the largest hospital in Yemen in Sana'a. He told me the ultrasound machine in the emergency department broke and they are, will have to wait for months for another ultrasound to get into Yemen. There is no other way to get an ultrasound to Yemen. This means that a lot of patients in the emergency care that need an ultrasound service are not gonna be able to receive it. It is also very challenging to repair anything because spare parts are also prevented from getting into the country. The closure of the airport has led to complete halt of commercial cargo, such as medicine, medical supplies, and equipment coming into the country. 
Add to this the restriction on Hadeda port, this has caused prices of medicine to double, making it unaffordable for most of the population and further contributing to the decline of Yemen's health system, already decimated by the conflict. Food, fuel, and medicine prices are beyond the reach of over 80% of the Yemeni population. 90% of Yemeni pregnant women today are iron deficient. Patients with chronic diseases cannot afford the monthly cost of their medicine. Parents of children with chronic diseases sell everything they own to cover the cost of medicine for a few months. A father just contacted me this week and was pleading with me to buy medicine for his child. The cost, the monthly cost of the medicine for this child is $500. The father doesn't even make $100 a month. Women who are experiencing complications during delivery cannot afford to get to the health facility. Many die in their homes. Because of the expensive fuel prices, most people now have motorcycles. Unfortunately, these drivers don't follow rules and don't use helmets, leading to increased accidents, deaths, and disabilities, especially among young people. So if we look at the impact of the closure of both Sana'a and Hadeida ports, we see that there are at least 28 million people in Yemen, according to UN reports, are in need. 12 million of them are in acute need, meaning they need uh, help immediately. We also have 4 million displaced people in Yemen. Food insecurity in Yemen grows as the economy shrinks, Ongoing devaluation of the Yemeni real and soaring prices are compounding hunger in Yemen. Like Hassan said, 16.2 million people in Yemen already face food insecurity this year. Food prices have risen by around 60% in some parts of Yemen. Driven by the collapse of the Yemeni real and intensifying already inadequate food consumption. In areas under the control of the internationally recognized government, that's supposed to be under the control of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Food has become more unaffordable. In July, the Yemeni real per, per US dollar exceeded 1,000. At the end of September, it surpassed 1,200 per US dollar. This is double what the exchange rate is in the North. It made food prices in the North, South extremely expensive. In southern areas of Yemen, where the Saudis and the Emiratis control everything, inadequate food consumption is now over 45%. Compare that to the north, where it's 37%. This is compounded by the high transportation costs resulting from high fuel costs and the effect of increasing global food prices. As you may all know, 90% of food and other essential commodities in Yemen are imported food prices are 4.5 times higher in cost today than they were before the Saudis started their attack on Yemen. If we look at the impact of children, there are 11.3 million children today who need humanitarian help. 10.2 million children need basic health services. 2 million Yemeni children are acutely malnourished. 8 million Yemeni children lack access to clean water. There's a vicious cycle of diarrheal diseases leading to malnutrition and malnutrition leading to other preventable diseases. There are 8.1 million children who need emergency education support and 2 million Yemeni children today are out of school. Mental health among school children in Yemen is quite high. In a recent study showed the estimate is 79% of Yemeni children suffer from PTSD. 10,000 children, according to UNICEF last week, were killed or maimed in this conflict. Homelessness. It's estimated there are 7 million people living in Sana'a today. Many are from other governors who escaped to Sana'a. As, you, as I drive in Sana'a today, I see whole families homeless, women and children and elderly. This has never been the case in Yemen. You never see homeless families. You may see homeless men, but never families. Beggars are at every corner. Many are older people or women with children. Again, this is a very new phenomenon for Yemen. 
if we look at the health system, we, if we start with COVID-19, we know that there is huge underreporting in Yemen for COVID-19, but we know from uh, just images of graveyards that they have to expand the graveyards, and not just that, they have to open new graveyards. So we know that at least 20% of those infected with COVID-19 die in Yemen. Half of the country's hospitals are out of service and the population has become vulnerable to endemic diseases, including cholera and polio. Polio was eradicated in Yemen. Yemen was free of polio for many, many years, since 2005. And now we have polio cases in Yemen. Diphtheria, the last time there was a diphtheria outbreak before the war was in 1980. And now we have a lot of children dying from diphtheria. Dengue fever now is very prevalent throughout Yemen, especially in the coastlines. And fortunately, we have now all the four serotypes in Yemen, which means every time there's an outbreak, we're gonna get severe disease and deaths. There are 20 million people in Yemen who need health assistance today, included, including 11.6 million who are in acute need of medical help. At least one child dies every 10 minutes because of preventable diseases in Yemen. This week, WHO released an estimate that says that three out of four Yemeni children today suffer, suffer from malnutrition. This, the impact of malnutrition among Yemeni children on the cognitive development is gonna be huge. And Yemen will be suffering from this for generations to come. Hospitals and health centers, like all basic needs, staff have been without salaries since August 2000. Last Thursday, the Saudi air, air strike in Sana'a hit a medical warehouse. Uh, you know, we already have scarcity of medical equipment and medicine. And just this last Thursday, they hit a medical warehouse. In 2021, air, air strikes increased compared to the previous year. This, of course, is all possible with the U.S. support. If we look at the Saudi UAE control of the South, security in the South is worse than it is in the North. There is constant fighting between the Saudi allied and the UAE allied forces. There is an economic collapse with the dollar there is um, more expensive, double than the, the dollar in, in the North. Safety for Northerners is lacking. Their businesses get raided and people detained without any cause. On October 11 of this month, a Yemeni flight could not land in Aden because the Saudi official responsible for granting access to landing was not available. It had to circle for a, lo a long time before they could reach the Saudi official. So he, a Saudi official, giving a Yemeni flight access to Aden airport. It's our land, it's our country, yet the flight cannot land without the Saudi official granting uh, access. UAE has changed the country code from Yemen to UAE in Sukhatra Island. They changed electricity meters of homes to those from UAE, making electricity very expensive for the local residents. They bring in tourists to Sukhatra without a Yemeni visa. Saudi Arabia brought in soldiers to Al Mahra. There are no Houthis in Al Mahra. They also control the airport and they control the uh, seaport and the land crossing in Oman. So these are areas where the Houthis never been, yet they are you know, controlling all these areas. And it's not, and I don't understand why are they in areas that they should not be in. And on top of all of that, the money that the Saudis and the Emiratis have has forced in a way the UN Human Rights Council to end the war crime probe in Yemen. That for the UN Human Rights Council to end the probe on war crimes in Yemen, that is just a very shameful act for the council and for those who push for that to happen. In terms of potential for peace, um, Yemeni tradition has many ways to resolve conflict. In the midst of the war, when Yemeni negotiate directly without outside interference, they almost always reach an agreement. They've had a lot of swaps of prisoners, of people who died in the field, when they do it without outside interference. Tribal negotiations help in declaring 
their area is neutral, avoiding fighters from any party in their area. If an area is controlled by one of the warring parties, negotiations assure safety of all people in the area. This avoids street fighting in Yemen. And that has been a blessing uh, for Yemen. And those are the traditions that help in, in Yemen that we don't have street fighting. In conclusion, we need to open Sana'a Airport and all Yemeni ports of entry, including Hodeida and Salif. Yemen economy must be revived. We cannot depend on aid for 30 million people. U.S. must stop supporting the Saudi-led war on Yemen. The Obama administration gave the green light to the Saudi to attack Yemen. During the Trump administration, we saw some acknowledgement from the Obama officials of the devastation on the Yemeni people their decision or lack of decision had produced for the Yemeni people. Now that these officials are back in power, they need to stay the course and help end the support for the Saudi-led coalition war on Yemen on, and on the Yemeni people. They should not, they should not back off now. Rep Representative Rokana amendment to the NDAA should be adopted. We also need to support a war power resolution for Yemen. And thank you. I should thank you so much. I'm so glad that you're safe. I'm so glad that you shared that with us. And I look forward to hearing more from you during the Q&A. I'm sure there are going to be a lot of questions directed your way. Um, if I may, I'd like to uh, hand the microphone over to Bruce Rydell after a quick introduction here. Um, Bruce Rydell is a senior fellow and director of the Brookings Intelligence Project, part of Brookings Center for 21st Century Security and Intelligence. In addition, Rydell serves as a senior fellow in the Center for Middle East Policy. Uh, he retired in 2006 after 30 years of service at the CIA, including postings overseas. He was a senior advisor on South Asia and Middle East to four presidents of the United States in the staff of the National Security Council at the White House. Uh, Bruce, thank you so much for joining us. I have a question for you. Um, you know, President Biden announced an end to U.S. support for offensive operations in Yemen in February. However, as you've written, Several times since, Saudi Arabia is still really dependent on ongoing forms of U.S. military assistance, including the transfer of spare parts and maintenance, uh, to continue aerial operations over Yemen and enforce the blockade. Can you provide some insights on the nature of ongoing support for the war right now uh, by the United States, uh, its impact on the warring parties, and what leverage you think the U.S. still has over the warring parties, if any? Uh, could compelling Saudi to actually lift the blockade help help us reach a ceasefire deal as the Houthis have claimed it would? Uh, Bruce, take it away. Certainly. And I also want to thank Aisha for that uh, very sobering uh, presentation on the situation in Yemen today. Uh, the United States uh, provides Saudi Arabia with a considerable military support. Uh, it is false to say that we are not involved in Saudi offensive military operations today. Uh, let's look at the various uh, services of the um, uh, Saudi military, starting most importantly with the Royal Saudi Air Force. About three quarters of the equipment of the Royal Saudi Air Force, American built, uh, America, sold from America. Uh, this includes uh, sophisticated uh, fighters like F-15s, that includes Apache uh, helicopter, combat helicopters, includes transport aircraft, uh, you name it, across the board. Uh, the other quarter or so uh, is supplied by the British uh, tornadoes, uh, primarily typhoons. Um, these kinds of modern uh, fixed and rotary wing aircraft require intense maintenance. Uh, for every hour in the air, they need something like four or five hours of maintenance on the ground in order to keep moving. Uh, parts wear out rapidly and have to be replaced. Uh, some parts need to be updated um, over the course of a year or so, uh, sometimes more quickly than that. Uh, virtually everything on an, a modern jet airplane 
uh, needs maintenance and new spare parts, new logistics. All of that comes from the United States. So you're talking from the advanced radar equipment, uh, you're talking about the munitions, uh, you're talking about things as, as relatively pedestrian as the jet tires. Um, modern jet aircraft, fighter aircraft, frequently blow out their tire uh, when they land because the force of the um, conflict between uh, being airborne and landing is so violent. Uh, those tires do not come from your local tire dealer. You have to have special uh, tires. All of that stuff comes from the United States. Let me also be very clear. You cannot use a Russian radar system on an American uh, jet. Uh, you can try, but you're likely to never see the pilot again after he goes up into the air. Uh, you cannot use a Chinese system. You can't even use a UK system on a US system. You have to have a, access to American spare ports. Under American law, no other country that we transfer spare uh, cell equipment to is allowed to transfer spare parts without our permission. Uh, as far as I know, no other country is transferring spare parts to the Royal Saudi Air Force. The bottom line is that the United States, uh, in terms of the Royal Saudi Air Force, United States and the United Kingdom are de facto co-participants in the blockade of Sana'a Airport, uh, in the bombing of uh, Houthi targets, uh, because without that American logistics, without that American expertise, without those American spare parts, those aircraft simply would be grounded. They wouldn't be able to continue. So the U.S. is very much complicit in the air war. It's less so in the naval war. Uh, Saudi Arabia has much more diversified sources of uh, naval equipment. But still, again, there is a sizable part that is American made. There is also, uh, I think, significant evidence of cooperation uh, between the United States and the Saudis on uh, blockade activities. Uh, from time to time, the United States Navy announces that it has apprehended a Dow or some other vessel uh, en route to Iran, I'm sorry, en route to Yemen uh, with Iranian equipment on it. Uh, we don't know how often this happens, um, but it has happened periodically over the last several years. That suggests very close cooperation uh, in the naval blockade. The naval blockade, though, is much less important than the air, air blockade. Um, it is the air blockade uh, that is, uh, Aisha putting it out, keeping all this equipment, especially medical parts, from getting to the, uh, to the Yemeni population. When you get to the ground components of both the regular Saudi Air Army uh, and the Saudi Arabian National Guard also have diversified. Um, the Army is more dependent upon the United States than the National Guard in terms of equipment. The National Guard is very, very dependent upon an American contractor for training uh, and its activities. Uh, the Saudi Army basically has been AWOL in this war for most of the war. Uh, it guards the borders of Saudi Arabia and doesn't even do a particularly good job of that. It's only in the stream east of the country, in Al Mahra province, that the Saudi military has moved in on the ground and essentially annexed El Mahra province uh, to, the, um, to the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, giving the kingdom uh, a, a land opening uh, to the Arabian Sea. Um, you talked about leverage, uh, what kind of leverage this gives us. I think it's useful there to compare the situation in Yemen to the situation in Syria. Uh, for the last decade, many have felt that the United States has done too little about the Syrian civil war. Part of the reason we've done too little about the Syrian civil war is we have virtually no leverage over the Syrian military. All of the Syrian military equipment, Air Force, Army, Navy, uh, is all Soviet era equipment provided back um, largely before uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, but with the spare parts and equipment continuing to flow uh, from the Russian Federation. Therefore, it's the Russians who had the leverage over the Syrian government. And they've obviously used it to support the Syrian government. In this case, in Yemen, it's the United States that has the leverage. We have enormous leverage over the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. If we told the Saudis that we are going to turn off the flow of spare parts, then 
the Saudis would have to listen to what the United States meant. And I think that the very first thing the United States should do is call for a, a complete lifting of the blockade in Yemen um, unconditionally uh, immediately. Um, the blockade uh, is what is causing a significant amount of the humanitarian crisis, not all of it, but a significant amount of the humanitarian crisis. Uh, and the blockade's not working. The purpose of the blockade was to keep the Houthis from getting access to equipment from the Iranians and technology from the Iranians for their uh, missile programs and their drone programs. Well, six years after the beginning of the blockade, all of those programs are still working. Equipment is still getting into the Houthis from the Iranians. Now, the amount of equipment is, is relatively small. Um, and it's important to remember at this case that this war, which costs the Saudis literally billions of dollars, if not tens of billions of dollars a year, costs the Iranians a pittance, maybe $20 million at most a year in terms of uh, supplies and equipment that they are coming into the Houthis. Uh, the longer this war continues, the more Saudi Arabia is going to go uh, into deeper financial holds, while Iran is able to per bog down its regional enemy in a quagmire that shows no hint of ever ending and which costs Saudi Arabia a fortune and costs Iran a trifle. Bottom line, there hasn't been any change in American military support for the Saudi war, Donald Trump, Joe Biden. By all the promises we heard back in February and March, the level of support continues and our leverage is not being used effectively to bring about an end to the war. Bruce, thank you so much. Uh, you always just lay it out in such a clear way. And I really appreciated your and Anel's amazing op-ed. And we're gonna be sharing some resources with, the part, um, with anybody that is here as an attendee after the, the Zoom panel. I also wanted to flag that uh, for folks, please submit questions via the Zoom Q&A function uh, for the end of our discussion and hang around till the end. So we'd love to have you uh, with us. Now I'm gonna pass it over to Anel Shaleen from the Quincy Institute. Dr. Shaleen is a research fellow uh, in the Middle East program at QI and an expert on religious and political authority uh, in the Middle East and North Africa. She was previously the Zwan a uh, postdoctoral fellow at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. And prior beginning her PhD, she worked as a journalist in Egypt and Yemen. She's done field work and research in Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Oman, Qatar, the UAE, Jordan, Morocco, and Egypt, and has an advanced proficiency in Arabic, French, and Spanish. Uh, Anel, you have quite the resume here, and we're so glad you're with us. I, I was hoping that you could help us with some geopolitical context. Consideration of this year's NDAA really does come at a crossroads uh, for the war in Yemen, as the Houthis have made substantial gains around Marev, and experts like Peter Salisbury have assessed that the war may be entering a critical new phase where this is no longer a stalemate. Can you give us some updates on the war, the broader geopolitical dynamics as it relates to Saudi, UAE, US, Iran, and others, as Congress considers these critical provisions to the FY 2022 NDAA, and what else does the US need to do, and what else do all the staffers on this call need to do to support diplomacy in Yemen? Uh, Anel, take it away. Thanks so much, Hassan, and many thanks to Aisha and to Bruce for their really informative and sobering comments. Um, Hassan, I'll, I'll get to, I will try to answer your, your multi-layered question, but I, I want to be sure also to address certain issues that are often raised about Yemen. And so one thing in particular, which, which Bruce spoke to, but I think is very important, is sort of this notion that 
uh, the misperception that, that the Houthis are really the problem here, that they're the ones driving the conflict and that the Saudis want peace. And I think it's very important to unpack that a bit because we did see the Saudis offer a ceasefire earlier this year. And so the Saudis have been able to say, hey, we, we want the war to end, we offered a ceasefire. And the US has operated under that assumption and has said, yeah, the Houthis are the problem here. However, we need to remember what are the terms of that ceasefire. These were laid out by UN Security Council, Security Council Resolution 2216 after the Saudis launched their military intervention in uh, spring of 2015. And essentially the terms of the ceasefire and the terms laid out in this UN Security Council resolution would require the Houthis to give up all of their weapons and give up all of the territory that they have acquired since 2014. This may have seemed appropriate at the time. Um, it is certainly not appropriate now. The Houthis very rightly feel that they are winning. And so they have no incentive to come to any sort of negotiation when UN Security Council Resolution 2216 remains the basis for the agreement. And so for that reason, the Saudis can put forward however many ceasefire proposals they want and say, look, we're pushing for peace, knowing that the Houthis would never agree to such non-starter terms. So in, in general there, I, I do think that it's, it's very important to keep in mind who are the aggressors here. The Saudis are bombing and blockading another country. The Houthis are in their own home country. And we know from global experience that eventually invaders do give up and go home, whereas the Houthis really have nowhere else to go. So eventually, you know, we've, we've heard from multiple people, the Saudis are, are, are sinking huge amounts of money into this failed war. And we know that they do want to get out. They're just trying to find a way to do so that helps Mohammed bin Salman save face. And I think it's very important that the US um, not bend over backwards to try to accommodate a, a, a Saudi political partner, geopolitical partner, who in general has not acted in a way that contributes to US interests in the region. So just, just to point out there that it's, it's very important to keep in mind that although the Houthis have committed horrible crimes and atrocities, just like the Saudis have, this is a war, this is what happens, in the end, it really is the Saudis who are the aggressors here. I think another important thing that often gets brought up is the situation in Madib. So Madib is a city, it's the, the, the city is the seat of a broader region, also called Madib. The city itself is about, I believe, 100 kilometers to the east of Sana'a. And this is the last bastion of support for the Hadi government. Hadi was... Um, uh, elected without any political competition after the previous president stepped down following Arab Spring protests. This happened in early 2012. He remains uh, considered the leader of the internationally recognized government of Yemen, and the Saudis intervened on his behalf to try to reinstate him in 2015. However, he has not been in Yemen since 2014 when he was forced to flee. And at this point, his government controls almost no territory. And so this is part of why we've seen such an emphasis on Madib from those who, who want to see him reinstated. And this is understandable to a certain extent because the Hadi government reflects this dream that came out of the Arab Spring that Yemen would be able to move towards a more democratic future. And you know, this is a dream that I think many in the US really also believed in. However, the unfortunate reality is that the longer the war goes on, the more that dream recedes and the less likely it is that Yemen will ever be able to be reconstituted into some kind of peaceful society. The longer the war goes on, the more we see the society breaking down. And unfortunately, as, as Hassan, you mentioned, what Peter Salisbury of the International Crisis Group was referring to was the fact that previously in the war, we had some, some main key players. We had the Houthis, we had the, the had the government supported by the Saudis, by the Saudi-led coalition. And then increasingly you had the Southern Transitional Council taking control of the former South Yemen with the help of the UAE. But those three main players are starting to break down. We're seeing more control by sort of local militia groups. We're seeing warlords. We're seeing the nephew of the previous um, president, Ali Abdullah Saleh, his nephew is holding territory in near Hodeida on the, the Red Sea coast. He is also working relatively closely with the UAE. 
in Hadramaut, we see um, other areas where control is, is diffuse. We are seeing the presence of Al-Qaeda, which is only going, the, the concern about Al-Qaeda is that the longer the Yemen war drags on, the more um, ungoverned space Al-Qaeda will be able to, to operate within it and potentially could pose a threat to the United States. So in general, uh, to get back to Marib, the, the emphasis has been on Marib in terms of this notion that if the Houthis take the city of Marib, this will cause a huge humanitarian catastrophe. And while that is a concern because Marib has been one of the few places where internally displaced people are able to go, it's been relatively stable, they have uh, fossil fuel resources there, and so there's been a relatively functioning economy where people are able to flee and, um, and at least exist. And so the concern is that if the Houthis take Marib, those million IDPs would be displaced into the empty quarter, into the desert. Um, however, what we've observed elsewhere is when the Houthis take territory, as Aisha was describing, they do have mechanisms for, for establishing ceasefires, for negotiating with local tribes to establish control. Again, not ideal. The Houthis are, are not good guys, but it is very unlikely that we would see sort of the, the carnage that certain people have talked about in saying that if the Houthis take Marib, we're going to have you know, a, a massive humanitarian catastrophe. What is most likely to happen is that the Houthis would take control. They'd negotiate with local uh, rulers, leaders, tribal leaders um, to sort of establish power sharing. And furthermore, part of the reason the Houthis are so desperate to take Marib is because of the ongoing fuel blockade. Marib has these fossil fuel resources, as I said, and if the fuel blockade were to be lifted, the Houthis wouldn't find it to be quite so necessary to establish control of Marib's resources. So interesting there that the Saudi blockade is actually what is helping to drive this Marib offensive, which is against one of the Saudis' uh, last sort of bastions of control within Yemen, other than in the east with Al-Mahra. Another um, issue to keep in mind here, there's been a lot of talk about this notion that the blockade isn't really the main driver of what we're observing in Yemen, that there are a lot of interlocking factors um, contributing to the level of the humanitarian catastrophe. And I think that is, that is true. There are many different drivers. We have one very important thing to keep in mind is that public servants haven't received salaries, some of them for years. So there's been, they have had no income. At the same time, the price of food and water has been going up exponentially. As Aisha was mentioning, the value of the real keeps falling. It's falling precipitously in the South, whereas under the Houthi control, they've managed to sort of stabilize it. But again, the value of the real is much less than it used to be. However, simply because the blockade is not the only factor driving all of these issues doesn't mean that the blockade isn't a factor and it's a factor that the US could actually have a big impact on. If the fuel blockade were to be lifted, then we would see more, more fuel coming in. This would allow for food and water to be transported much more easily, uh, which would reduce the, the cost of these items and would also help to get the Yemeni economy started again. As Aisha said, 30 million people cannot survive on humanitarian aid alone, which itself is quite underfunded. For years, humanitarian organizations have been begging for more money for Yemen and they, they haven't been receiving it. So clearly aid, is, is not the answer, it's not working for Yemen and, and Yemen is starving. I'll, I'll stop there, Hassan, I'm not sure if I, if I got to all of your questions, um, but I just did just wanna make sure that I addressed some of these issues that are often brought up when I'm in conversation with um, others who work on Yemen. And, and now, thank you so much. That was really insightful and you did answer my questions and I really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to be turning it over to Marcus Stanley. Now, uh, Marcus is fantastic. He's the advocacy director of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Uh, prior to joining Quincy, he spent a decade at Americans for Financial Reform, where he helped direct the efforts of a coalition of 200 organizations on a range of le legislative and regulatory initiatives to challenge the power of Wall Street. Before that, he was an economic and policy advisor to Senator Barbara Boxer as a senior economist at the U.S. Joint Economic Committee. 
While he was there, he produced War at Any Price, a seminal study on the full cost of the Iraq invasion used to build political support to end the U.S. role in the war. Um, Marcus, so glad you're with us. Uh, this has really been a fantastic panel so far. I urge all of our attendees to put questions in the chat. Um, Marcus, I was wondering, um, you know, given all that you've just heard, what message do you have for staffers on this call regarding the various Yemen provisions in the National Offense Authorization Act? Uh, could you offer us some analysis on the different legislative vehicles, uh, like, like the Rokana Amendment, the Meeks Amendment, and the Senate uh, language? And I'd also love to know your thoughts on the efficacy of Congress utilizing other legislative vehicles like a War Powers Resolution to end all support for the war and compel Saudi to lift its blockade. Marcus, let us know. Thank you, Hassan. Uh, so yeah, we've had great panelists describing the situation in Yemen. I'm going to focus on the situation in Congress, where, as Hassan said, uh, we here in Washington, D.C. face a really stark choice about whether we are going to hold the Biden administration to its campaign promise of ending U.S. support uh, for the uh, atrocities and the continuing war in Yemen. And we have the leverage with Saudi Arabia to do that. Uh, the question is uh, whether we will. And at this point, it's really, I think, crucial for Congress to step in because the status quo just has not, the status quo on the ground in Yemen just has not changed under the Biden administration. Uh, Congress has uh, repeatedly requested clarification from the Biden administration as to uh, what the plans are and why that is. That clarification has not been forthcoming. And now uh, with the national, uh, with the NDAA uh, debate and vote, uh, we have legislation on the table uh, that would end US support for uh, Saudi actions in, uh, in Yemen. Uh, we also have legislation on the table that purports to do that, but I think uh, would not do that. Uh, so we face a, a really critical choice and the, the choice is uh, in the NDAA context, and I'll also talk about uh, what might follow after the NDAA uh, as well, but in the NDAA context, uh, we face the choice between uh, three items of legislation. Um, one, uh, a, a provision uh, that has already passed the House from Senator Ro Khanna and is being introduced into the Senate uh, by Senator Sanders. We don't know if it's going to receive a, a vote as a, an amendment to the Senate NDA. Uh, the second is a, a provision uh, from Representative Meeks that is also passed the House, part of the House NDA. And the third is the current uh, base text language in the, um, in the uh, Senate NDA. Uh, and I'm gonna uh, try to share my screen here. Um, so hopefully uh, you can see that, um, which has the, uh, the text of these three uh, amendments. Um, the, the first, amend the, the first uh, amendment, which I have up now is the Kana amendment, which will also be introduced uh, by Senator Sanders. And Senator Sanders is seeking a vote on this as an amendment to the, uh, the base text of the NDA. And this is very straightforward amendment, uh, which simply prohibits uh, US intelligence sharing for offensive co uh, coalition strikes. And very importantly, uh, bans all logistical support for all uh, Saudi strikes, however they're classified, including by through maintenance or spare parts. And we heard uh, Bruce Riddell uh, state that, that that maintenance and spare parts is critical uh, to keeping uh, Saudi warplanes in the air. The Saudis could not engage in strikes in Yemen without that U.S. support, and the Khan of Sanders Amendment would ban it. Uh, and then we also have a uh, restatement of uh, the War Powers Act uh, restrictions on U.S. engagement, basically repeating that Congress does not approve uh, any U.S. involvement with Saudi, the Saudi military forces involved in uh, hostilities against the Houthis in Yemen. And that, I think, is the straightforward amendment, the Khan of Sanders Amendment, which would uh, be effective uh, in cutting off 
uh, support for uh, Saudi operations in Yemen. Then the second is we have the Meeks Amendment, which is also part of the House NDAA. And this is a, a much more lengthy and convoluted amendment that I believe would not be effective in cutting off that support. Uh, it starts off with a statement of policy, uh, which of course is not binding, uh, just in general stating that we wish to make things better in Yemen. Uh, but all the binding provisions in this amendment are dependent on this determination and report to Congress. And the idea here in the, in the Meeks Amendment is rather than simply ban support uh, to the Saudis for their operations in, in Yemen, uh, we are gonna do this report. Uh, it will take 90 days, there'll be 90 days permitted uh, to determine uh, whether any Saudi air units have engaged in uh, offensive strikes that created uh, civilian casualties. So uh, it's gotta be offensive airstrikes resulting in civilian casualties, and we have to document which Saudi military units have engaged in this, and we have only 90 days to do it. Uh, now, you know, any of you familiar with how difficult it is to determine things uh, with absolute certainty in a war zone are going to realize that this, it's going to be <laughs> extraordinarily difficult to do such a report and have it be definitive. Um, you know, and that, that's an understatement. And then the prohibition in this amendment only applies to Saudi military units who have been found through this determination and report, who are listed in this determination and report as having engaged in offensive airstrikes causing civilian casualties. The only restriction in this amendment is that we cannot provide uh, equipment to those specific Saudi units. So even if we manage to, uh, you know, within 90 days, come up with definitive evidence about offensive airstrikes causing civilian casualties, the restriction is only on those military units who engaged in those airstrikes. So uh, the Saudi Arabia could simply use another military unit and get U.S. support for doing uh, military uh, doing airstrikes with that other unit. So between these two things, you know, and we, we've already seen that there's enormous difficulties determining what is meant by an offensive airstrike uh, because, you, you, you know, the Biden administration already claims they're not supporting offensive airstrikes, but we have not seen any slowdown in the number of airstrikes within Yemen. So I, I would say between the need to, to achieve, accomplish this report, which demonstrates offensive airstrikes, civilian casualties, ties it to specific units, and then only cutting off aid to those specific units, the chance that this amendment is effective in, uh, in really cutting off U.S. support uh, for the war in Yemen, I would say, you know, approaches zero. Um, and then as if that isn't enough, we have a further exemption um, saying uh, that none of this applies to, uh, to any uh, airstrikes that are degrading the ability of the Houthi to launch missiles into Saudi Arabia, which is another thing extraordinarily difficult to, uh, to provide. So the list of exemptions here, you know, this brings it re really down to zero. This amendment is just flat out not going to be effective in cutting off US support. Uh, then we have the base text in the Senate version um, where once again, it, it, it states that there's a cutoff to, to Department of Defense support for offensive operations. So right off the bat, this is only limited to offensive operations against the, against the Houthis. So if the Saudis classify this as somehow a defensive operation uh, tied to preventing some form of Houthi aggression, they can still do it. Uh, but then we give basically unlimited ability to the Secretary of Defense to waive this prohibition if the secretary determines that the waiver is in the national security interests of the United States uh, and, and tells Congress about it. Um, so um, the, um, and, and then we also have the rule of construction saying that nothing can live in, in this can limit uh, US support for operations to defend against uh, 
against missiles. Um, so, so once again, this is this is not a definitive cutoff. This is sort of an optional cutoff at the discretion of the Secretary of Defense. Uh, so, when you add this all up, you know we've got a lot of verbiage and language. It's clear there's some language in the NDAA that is going to purport to do something about Yemen, but it's critical what that language is. And really, only the definitive cutoff in the the Kana Sanders Amendment is actually going to have impact in cutting off our support for this war. Uh, if it, if the cutoff depends on some kind of complicated determination of exactly who is doing what, or if the cutoff is at the discretion uh, of the Department of Defense, um, then you know that is not a cutoff in our support for this war. Uh, so I would just urge people, th this is really where you as a staffer play a critical role in explaining to your boss that not all language about Yemen is equal. We can't just be satisfied with language that pretends to do something about U.S. support, but does not in fact do something. Uh, and that unfortunately, the Biden administration has not on its own ended support, and it's necessary for Congress to be definitive in how it acts on this. Um, and we, we could see the NDA debate starting up in the Senate uh, as early as next week. Um, and part of that debate is gonna be whether the Sanders Amendment gets a vote on the floor. Uh, I would urge you to talk to your bosses uh, to support, weigh in uh, with Senator Reid and others to support uh, a vote on the floor for the, the sanders Kana amendment, um, to vote for that amendment if it reaches the floor. And frankly, I think we all need to keep an eye on the NDAA. And if that language that's in the NDAA is not satisfactory, if it's not that definitive cutoff that we saw in the sanders Kana amendment, uh, then I think it's necessary for Congress to act definitively to bring something like a war powers resolution to the floor uh, that could be brought up by any member, uh, receive expedited consideration, uh, and, and a vote could not be stopped. And that war powers resolution framework would permit Congress to act definitively on fairly short notice. And it's something that any office can do. It's not something dependent for bringing the vote on, on, on leadership. Um, and I think if that vote, a war powers vote reaches the floor, that becomes a real make or break moment that shines a light on this issue. Um, so, uh, you know, I know we're, we're gonna run over here with the Q and A and so, sorry for the length, but uh, that, that's just, um, yeah, my, my summary of the situation. Uh, Hassan, you wanna take us into uh, Q and A? Uh, Marcus, thank you so much. That's really helpful for you to have kind of dug into the weeds of these different provisions and really laid out in a really clear way what options Congress has available to it. I do see some great questions in the chat here so far. Um, uh, you know, one is about the recent uh, weapon sale that was announced by, uh, by, Con uh, by the Biden administration. They notified Congress that there was a $500 million dollars uh, sale and potential sustainment contracts for Saudi helicopters, including attack helicopters. Uh, yet at the start of the year, the administration indicated it would end support to offensive operations in Yemen. Are these helicopters likely to be a part of these offensive operations? Um, and is there a distinction between offensive and defensive weapons? Uh, you know, and, and are those relatively meaningless here? Bruce, I think you're well equipped to, to handle this one if, if you don't mind. Uh, the attack helicopter uh, is, as the name implies, offensive military weapon. Um, this is, these helicopters are used for a variety of tasks. When they actually fire their weapons, uh, it is almost always in an offensive military mode. Um, th this distinction that Biden administration through between offense and defense uh, is cute, but it's not really very helpful. Um, the, anyone who's, who's served in combat will tell you that there isn't a lot of difference between being in a defensive mode and being in an offensive mode, particularly when you're flying a jet, a jet aircraft 
or an attack helicopter. So I think this is very much uh, back to the good old days in terms of contracts with the Saudi military. Uh, thank you, that's really helpful. So there's another question here. Um, as I understand it, the, uh, the questioner writes, the Saudi Arabian government spends a tremendous amount of money in Washington. How does this affect the narrative about Yemen that we hear on the Hill and in the media? And how, does, uh, how would a Yemen war powers resolution um, you know, help in challenging that narrative if these NDAA provisions don't pass? Uh, I think a number of our, our guests could answer that. Um, maybe, Anel, you want to try to start us off? Sure. I mean, I think the amount of foreign money sloshing around Washington and and elsewhere uh, is pretty alarming. Um, I, I would actually argue that I think the Emiratis have been more effective at being able to control the narrative. I mean, clearly, in in right now, we're focusing on what the the Saudis are doing and the way the U.S. should try to influence Saudi actions in Yemen. But we shouldn't forget that the UAE remains quite involved in Yemen, and you know, both Saudi and the UAE spend huge amounts of money in DC and enjoy very close relationships with the US, but the Saudis tend to get a lot more criticism. Um, in general, I, I, I like, as, as I was saying, I, I think the UAE has been more effective at helping to shape the narrative. I think we do see a lot of criticism of the Saudis. In terms of what a war powers resolution would do to shape the Saudi narrative, I mean, I, I think it would have a bigger impact than that. I think it would help to reassert congressional authority in, in the constitutionally um, appropriated power to, to declare war. This is what the constitution um, gives gives Congress the power to do. And so in general, I think that not only would a war powers resolution clearly be necessary because we haven't seen the administration living up to its own promises in terms of, of what it said it was going to do of ending US complicity in the war. Um, but this would also have broader effects in, in trying to get Congress to reassert its authority on war fighting in general. Oh, Hassan, I don't think we can hear you. Apologies. Thank you so much, uh, Marcus or Bruce, if you have anything else to add to that. Otherwise, I can go to the next question. I just uh, think a, a war yeah. powers resolution would be really critical in giving this issue uh, a moment on center stage. And it would be it would be very difficult for the, the administration, given its campaign promises and given uh, the horrors of what is happening, uh, to to oppose that uh, that resolution uh, or attempt to veto it as as Trump did. Yeah, thank you so much, Marcus. Um, this next one actually is for Aisha. Uh, if she could come on camera, um, you know, she said she was intrigued by Anel's comment about the Arab Spring and how supporters of Hadi think it would lead to democracy. Uh, I would just love for you to comment on that and you know let us know your thoughts. Thank you, Hassan. Yeah, I was actually quite surprised uh, and intrigued by the fact that people think that the Arab Springs and supporting the war on Yemen, the Saudi-led war on Yemen, is because we're holding to that dream of democracy. The fact that Saudi and UAE are leading that coalition that are anti-democratic, that people, if they tweet, they get jailed for four years, are going to be supporting democracy in Yemen is, is laughable. So that, agree, that argument that the Saudi and the Emirati uh, are supporting that government, and the people think that they're supporting them to bring democracy to Yemen, um, it's just non-starter. Uh, I, I don't believe in that. Um, these are some of the most oppressive regimes in the region. They uh, survey, the, survey their population, they tap uh, you know, their phones, and we've learned that they don't just tap their phones, they tap all the enemy's phones, including foreign officials. So um, I don't know why people think that Saudi Arabia or the UAE want democracy in Yemen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aisha. Um, you know, this question was not asked by uh, anybody in the Q&A function, but it's something that I've heard a lot on the Hill, or I've 
I shouldn't say a lot, but I have heard it, that the ongoing U.S. support might not actually be covered by a war powers resolution. That, uh, you know, maybe the NDA could work, but a war powers resolution couldn't necessarily cover, you know, the, the existing forms of support. Marcus, I'm wondering if you could, you know, respond to that and maybe take us into a little bit of the weeds of what the War Powers Act is and, and why it apl- still applies to, you know, this ongoing transfer of spare parts and maintenance. Okay, l- let me um, bring up the... Uh, so, so the, the War Powers Resolution, uh, like like many uh, uh, congressional, uh, you, you know, like like many laws, it has uh, language in it which uh, which can admit of of different interpretations. Um, and Section Eight A of the and and the the specific issue that people bring up is what what does it mean. Uh, for the United States to uh, participate in in a war, and Section 8A of the War Powers Resolution uh, says that uh, the U.S. participates in a war when uh, civilian or military personnel of the Department of Defense command, coordinate, participate in the movement of, or accompany um, forces when uh, of a foreign country in which. Um, there exists an imminent threat that those forces become engaged in hostilities. I'm, I'm semi-paraphrasing there, but um, but the the argument then becomes: Is the U.S. commanding, controlling, uh, participating in the movement of uh, Saudi forces that are that are engaged in hostilities in Yemen? Now, it would it would seem obvious that if you're taking airplanes and making it possible for airplanes to fly, and as Bruce said, uh, you know, putting the tires on and putting parts in airplanes after which they take off and uh, and bomb uh, Yemen, that you are participating in the movement of those, those airplanes. Uh, certainly that is an entirely reasonable interpretation of that, that language. Um, and one could also say that you're coordinating or you're 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 doing other sorts of things. But uh, arguments can be made that you know under some possible interpretation of that language, that uh, providing spare parts or maintenance uh, might not, by some definition, fall under that language. Uh, well, you, you know, I, I would say to that, Congress is the authority. On the meaning of of words that uh, that Congress has has passed, I think a court would be extraordinarily reluctant to take language like that and say, uh, "Oh, Congress, you know, you passed a War Powers Resolution saying we have to get out of this war, uh, but I'm now going to say that uh, uh, helping airplanes fly does not count as participating in the movement of airplanes." You, you know, that would be extremely abstruse and philosophical way to uh, try to strike down participation in a war. Uh, so Congress really, I think, has the freedom to determine uh, what that language means. Um, and so, so I would say that it is well within Congress's authority to invoke the War Powers Resolution uh, in the case of, of U.S. participation in uh in the Yemen war. And of course, someone can always come up with some interpretation of, of language that that conflicts, but but Congress is not bound by that. Marcus, that was extremely helpful and a great quick paraphrasing of the War Powers Act. I'm really impressed on that. Um, we're, we're maybe ask one more question and I'll give uh, the last word to our panelists uh, in the order of uh, you know how they went in the order of our panel. I wanted to say thank you again so much to everybody uh, for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Quincy. Thank you, Demand Progress. Uh, you know, thank you to Cat and FCNL here for all your support in the back end. And obviously, thanks to our esteemed panelists. Um, you know, with with everything that we've heard, uh, I think staffers on the call want to know you know, what is the one thing that they can ask their boss to do right now? Um, with, with, with regard, you know, we have all these different legislative proposals. You know, I think it's been pretty clear what uh, some of the folks here, but maybe just spell it out as easily as they can, uh, as you can, so that they, they know what the big takeaway and action item is for, uh, for them and their boss.
I would say, you know, if you're in the Senate, uh, approach leadership and Senator Reid about getting a vote for the Sanders Amendment on the to the NDAA on the floor. Uh, if in, if you're in the House, uh, approach um, uh, Chairman Smith and and leadership about making sure that the Kana Amendment is not struck from the text of the NDA. Uh, you know, the Meeks Amendment can maybe stay in there, but as, as I said, it's uh, it's a toothless amendment if the Kana Amendment is not there. And if, uh, if, if the Kana Sanders language is not in the NDA, I think uh, you should talk to your boss about uh, being that member who steps up and introduces a war powers resolution. That's that simple. Marcus, thanks for putting such a fine point on that. Um, and uh, with that, maybe we can have a final word, uh, you know, final 30 seconds or so from, from Aisha, then Bruce, and then Nell, then Marcus in that order. Thank you, Hassan, and thank you, uh, the panelists and everybody on the call again. I would also echo what Marcus said, and I will also call on my uh, fellow Washingtonians in the state of Washington to call on Adam Smith and, uh, you know, pre pressure uh, him or have him understand that the Roe Kana uh, amendment is very important for us to end the support for the Saudi war in Yemen and to end the suffering in Yemen. The suffering in Yemen is caused by the US support and it's time to end it. I would echo uh, my colleagues have said, uh, we need the Kahana uh, Mark Sanders uh, amendments to be passed. Uh, Joe Biden's administration has had its opportunity to do the right thing in Yemen, and we have the answer. They're not going to do it. They haven't done it. It's up to the Congress of the United States now to end this terrible uh, uh, American support for what is pretty close to an act of genocide going on in Yemen. Uh, just to echo what Marcus said in terms of what members of, of Congress and what staff can do. And I would I would just want to address there was one question um, from a, an audience member asking if there's if there's so many organizations working on this, why haven't we seen a shift? And and I think that has been very frustrating for those of us who have worked on this. Um, and un unfortunately, I think this has to do with the fact that the Biden administration has chosen to prioritize this relationship with Saudi Arabia, which remains the, the largest purchaser of American made weapons, uh, that they're prioritizing that, even though the Saudis have consistently acted in a way that is not in keeping with US interests. And that we, as, as the American people, as, as those in a position to perhaps have, have influence on Congress, we need to push uh, the Biden administration to say that it's not acceptable to continue to put Saudi preferences and the preferences of weapons manufacturers over the lives of the people of Yemen. Well, I think my colleagues pretty much uh... Uh, summed it up. It's it's up to Congress, um, and I, I guess the last thing I would say is it's it's not it's also not helping. Uh, not not only is it catastrophic for Yemen, it's it's not helping the United States uh, or the broader region or the world to keep this open sore of a, to continue this open sore of a, a war in in Yemen uh, and withdrawing our support for it, helping helping bring it to to an end is going to be. Uh, good for Yemen, good for the region, and good for the United States. Well, thank you all so much for a really informative panel about a truly heartbreaking issue. And I, I really hope that uh, the staffers on this call, you know, got the information they needed to report back to their uh, respective colleagues and their bosses and, and uh, you know, work via the NDAA to end all U.S. complicity in the Saudi-led coalition's war and blockade on Yemen. And so we can uh, move to healing and reconstruction and recovery. So with that, we can end there. And I hope everybody has a great rest of your day.